Hello everyone, I am Jonathan Little from MyPokerCoaching.com and today I have my 10 top tips to help you crush cash games. Understand that cash games can be an incredibly profitable form of poker if you play well and these 10 tips will help you do exactly that. Tip number one is that aggression wins. At the end of the day, poker is all about equity realization. For example, say we both have hands that are going to win 50% of the time. It's 50-50. But what if I bet and make you fold sometimes? Let's say 3% of the time. Well, now it's not really 50-50 anymore, is it? Because I am stealing that 3% equity from you whenever I happen to make you fold. And then the rest of the time, we're 50-50. Understand that this is what happens in poker a lot. If you get to see more showdowns than your opponent's, that is excellent for you because at the showdown, you get to see how often you win, right? When you bet and your opponents fold to your bets, that's also excellent for you because you're going to be capturing some of their equity. For example, say you raise and the big blind calls and the flop comes whatever. Say it comes 9-8-3. Your opponent has king four. If they check, you're going to bet and they're going to fold their king four most of the time. But realize they're going to get a king on the turn sometimes and win. Maybe even a four to make a pair, a bad pair that's going to win sometimes. Sometimes their king high is just good. But by betting, you make them fold out all of their equity. And if you do this over and over and over again, little bits of equity that are not yours are going to flow your direction. And that is what makes a good, strong, winning poker player. Aggression wins at the end of the day. Tip number two is that you have to keep studying. All competitive games get tougher over time for all sorts of reasons. I mean, consider sprinting, running as fast as you can. Back in the day, people thought it was impossible for someone to run, um, let's say, a four-minute mile. They thought it was absolutely impossible. But then one person did it. They broke the four-minute mile. And guess what happened shortly after that? A whole lot of people broke the four-minute mile. And even today, people are running faster than they ever have because, well... Tools are getting better. Resources are getting better. People are understanding proper techniques and forms better. Nutrition's getting getting better, right? A whole lot of things are getting better, and that allows people to run faster and faster and faster and faster. And in poker, we have developed a whole lot of tools, and we've learned a whole lot over the last 100 years that have allowed poker players to play very, very well today, and people are going to continue playing better and better in the future. All competitive games get tougher over time. And if you are not constantly improving your skills, but your opponents are, you're going to quickly become a losing player. There's a whole lot of poker players who were super crushers back in 2003. And now they cannot even compete in the smallest stakes games because they thought they knew it all. They stopped studying. And well, guess what? The game passed them by and now they can't make it. If you want to study a lot, make sure you check out all the content on mypokercoaching.com and on this YouTube channel. Tip number three is to adjust to your opponents. Your opponents will probably not play perfectly. They're going to make mistakes. And when your opponents make mistakes, you can make a ton of money by maximally exploiting their mistakes. Playing the game theory optimal strategy or something close to it is fine, but exploiting will win you way more. For example, say on the river, you have top pair with a bad kicker. You check, and your opponent makes a pot size bet. Should you call? Well, it depends, right? If you know for a fact, because you've played with this player a ton, that they do not bluff nearly often enough, and when they bet pot on the river, they usually have top pair, good kicker, or better, which you lose to, you should fold. This is an example of exploiting your opponent. You know that your opponent doesn't bluff enough, therefore you're folding a hand that should reasonably call some portion of the time. What if your opponent... Whenever they bet pot on the river, they're always bluffing. And when they bet half pot, they always have the nuts. Well, now, if they pot the river, you have an easy call with top pair no kicker because you beat everything. But whenever they half pot it, you should actually fold, right? So learning what your opponents do with specific types of hands in specific scenarios will allow you to maximally exploit them and completely crush them. That said, make sure that you actually do know what your opponent's doing correctly because if you adjust to a tendency that you think exists but does not exist, well, that may not work out for you very well at all. So make sure you know what you're doing. Tip number four 
is to only play when you feel ready. You want to make sure that you are playing poker when you are ready to play and focus on poker. I realize that life happens. We all have things going on. Business happens. Family things happen. Relationships happen. Maybe you get distracted by something on TV. Understand that all of these distractions will negatively impact your poker game because you're not going to pick up on all the various things that your opponents are doing incorrectly, and that's going to result in you not exploiting those things. If you would rather be doing something else, go and do something else. There will be a poker game for you to play tomorrow. Tip number five. This is an important one. Know when to quit a poker cash game session. I strongly recommend that you have a system in place before you even start playing for when you plan to quit your session. This should probably be when you lose some amount of money or when some amount of time has passed. Back whenever I used to play 5, 10, and 10, 20, no limit at Bellagio every day, I would show up at noon. That was when I was going to start my session. And then I would play either until midnight, a nice long 12-hour session, or I would quit if I got down 450 big blinds, which you know, may sound like a lot, but they were actually kind of normal swings in the game. So at uh, 5, 10, no limit, if I got down $4,500, I would be done for the day. If I got up $4,500, I would not quit. You have to understand that if you are losing in a game, presumably, either you're getting unlucky or the game's kind of tough. If you're crushing a game, presumably, either you're getting lucky or the game is especially soft. If the game is especially soft, you don't want to quit. Some people think, all right, I won my money for the day. I'm going home. But no, 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 no. Whenever the games are great, that is when you need to be actively playing. Um, what a lot of people do is they have no idea in their mind where they're going to quit their session. They show up, they play, and they play until either they lose all the money they have or, well, usually just until they lose all the money they have or until they pass out because they're so tired. They do not ever pick it up and quit because, well, they put in a nice long session and they're starting to get a little bit fatigued and they're not paying such great attention anymore. And that results in them losing at the end of their sessions a ton. So many people come to me and say that I lose during the last two or three hours of my session every single time. What's going on? Well, the answer is they're playing a little bit too long and they are not mentally strong enough yet to play these long sessions and they start making blunders at the end of the day. So they need to slowly work on getting more stamina, but they also probably just need to start quitting sooner for that day. And that's going to result in them capturing a whole lot of those losses because the last three hours, they're playing quite poorly. If you play quite poorly, well, you're pretty likely to lose. Also, if you are going to be playing long sessions or sessions at all, you want to make sure you plan your breaks. Um, I would often take a break whenever one of the weakest players at the table would take a break because if the weakest player at the table is gone, the game just got tougher. And if the game is tougher, you're going to have a smaller win rate. Now, if everybody did that, the game was broke. So well, would break up and well, that wouldn't be good. You wouldn't have a game to play. So maybe you can't necessarily do that all the time, but you do want to make sure that you plan breaks logically so that you don't miss very many hands and so that you're away from the table as little as possible while still giving yourself a bit of a break. Tip number six is to prepare for your sessions. You need to plan ahead so that you are prepared to play. You need to take everything you need to the casino with you to play. You probably want to take a bag or a backpack that has some water, maybe some headphones, maybe some food, right? You want to make sure that you have whatever you need with you so that you are generally comfortable and happy sitting in the chair playing poker. Also, before you go to play, you should review all the common spots you are highly likely to be in. This is usually going to mean reviewing spots that come up before the flop because they come up all the time. Maybe you want to be reviewing various charts for what to do if someone raises before you in the cutoff and you're on the button and you're playing 200 big blinds deep in your cash game. What should you be re-raising? What should you be calling? What should you be folding, right? You want to be considering all these spots you are very likely to be in and just make sure that you play those spots well because if a spot comes up all the time and you mess it up, well, that's going to result in you losing in the long run. Definitely have a clear plan laid out for the day. Don't go in just thinking, all right, I'm going to go in there and gamble and see what happens. You want to make sure that you have ideas for things you're going to be working on in your game. You want to make sure that there are some mistakes that you know you've made in the past that you're not going to make today. And you want to make sure that you are actively improving your skills every single time you play. Tip number seven is to isolate limpers aggressively. A limper is a player who just calls the big blind before the flop. So say you're playing one two no limit, they would put in $2. Most players raise 
with their best hands before the flop because they want to get money in and they want to protect their hand, right? So when they do limp, when they just call the big blind, they usually, not always, but usually do not have one of their best hands. So if they don't have one of their best hands, this allows you to raise them and apply a lot of pressure because their range should be weak. Imagine you know your opponent raises the top 15% of hands, but then limps 15% down to 40%, right? Well, that range is pretty garbage. And if you just apply aggression, they're not going to make that many great hands on the flop because they're starting with bad hands to begin with, and you're going to be able to run them over and over-realize your equity. Going back to tip number one, aggression wins, right? So you can apply a lot of aggression against their weak range. When you are going to raise over a limper, you want to make it four big blinds plus one big blind for each limper. And usually you're going to want to do this with a reasonable linear range, which just means the best hands, like good pairs, suited connected hands, high cards, suited aces, suited kings, stuff like that because those hands are going to crush that middle type of range that your opponent has. So not only are you going to over-realize your equity because their, your opponent's going to fold too often, you're just going to be playing hands that dominate them, and that's going to allow you to absolutely crush the limpers. Tip number eight is to do not slow play too often. You want to play big pots with your best hands and small pots with your small hands. So don't slow play your best hands. When you are the previous aggressor, so say you raise pre-flop, someone calls. If you flop a really good hand, just keep betting. Put money in the pot. Don't get tricky and check raise because you can't count on your opponents to bet for you. Just keep betting. Now, don't bet five times the size of the pot. Bet as you would most of your other hands, but keep betting. As the previous caller, say someone raises and you call from the big blind. The flop comes, whatever. You have the nuts. You check. They bet. You probably want to raise. You're going to be checking everything from out of position when you're playing deep stacked, by the way. You should usually not have much of a leading range. So you check everything. They bet. You need to be raising immediately and just getting money in the pot. When they have nothing, they're going to fold and you're not going to win a big pot. But when they have something good, like a pair or a draw, the pot's going to get gigantic and you are going to win a ton of money. The one exception to this rule is top set on an uncoordinated board. A set is three of a kind where one well, where two of the cards are in your hand and one is on the board. So like on nine, six, three, pocket nines would be top set. The reason slow playing top set makes sense is because when you have top set, your opponent is way less likely to have top pair, which is a hand that will bet and then not fold, right? So maybe a slow play top set, but look, I'm telling you everything else in general, you just want to raise and bet and get money in the pot because you want to play big pots with your best hands. Step number nine is to expand your bluffing range. This might get some of you in a little bit of trouble, but most of you don't bet as a bluff often enough. Many players bet only with their strong made hands and obvious bluffs, like strong draws. If you flop an open-ended straight draw or flush draw, you bet it, which is fine and good. However, you should often bluff a bit more often, and that's especially true in heads-up pots when it's just you and one other player. If there are a bunch of players in the pot, Chill out with bluffing because someone's likely to have something. And if it's not you, it's probably one of them. So you got to be careful there. But against only one player, you really do need to be bluffing a pretty good amount of the time. Some strong bluffs to consider that you may not naturally consider are unpaired high cards like Queen Jack on 873. Why Queen Jack on 873? Well, if you get a Queen or a Jack, it's almost always good, right? Also, Queen High is probably not good. So this is a pretty good hand to bet because if your opponent folds out King High or Ace High, great. And if they do call you, you can spike a queen or a jack and still probably win. Another good hand to bet is a gut shot straight draw, like 9-5 on 8-7-3. If you get that 6, you have almost nuts and can be very happy playing a big pot. Also, if you get a 9, you could easily be good. This is another spot where 9 high is probably not good, but if you bet and your opponent folds, it's great. And if they call, well, you might get lucky sometimes. Also, over cards with backdoor flush draws such as 10-8 on 6-5-2. It's another example of over cards that, you know, almost certainly are not good. But if you do happen to improve to a backdoor flush draw or a backdoor straight draw, um, say you have 10-8 of hearts and there's one heart on the flop. If it turns another heart, you can easily keep betting because if you make a flush on the river, that's great. And um, even if you get something like a 9 on the turn, you have 10-9-8-6, you can keep betting. You spike a 10 or an 8 or a 7. You're usually pretty happy, right? One other hand to bet is something like king high with a backdoor flush draw. So say you have king four suited and it comes 
Seven, six, two, with one of your flush draws. That's another good spot to bet because the king is probably good if you hit. You can also get a backdoor flush draw on the turn that will allow you to keep bluffing. So these are usually very good spots to continue bluffing and expanding your bluffing range. Tip number 10 is to control the size of the pot when you do not have the nuts or a very, very strong hand. You want to play big pots with your big hands, right? Don't slow play. But you want to play small pots with your small hands. And this often results in you checking your medium strength hands, like top pair with a weak kicker, down to ace high. These hands are usually good if a little bit of money goes in the pot. They are not so good if a ton of money goes in the pot. So your plan is usually to put in one or maybe two post-flop bets with these hands, depending on how strong they are. Top pair is obviously way better than ace high, right? Top pair can put in maybe two bets. Ace high, uh, maybe one. So this is a spot where, say you raise, the big blind calls, the flop comes, they check, you bet, they call. On the turn, especially if it's a kind of scary turn, if they check, check it back with top pair. It's fine. On the river, if they bet, you can easily call. You put two bets in with top pair, you're almost always good. However, let's say you bet the flop and they call, and then you bet the turn, and they raise you. Well, now you put in a flop bet and a turn bet, and now they're raised. There's already three bets going in. That's not good. And they can easily bet again on the river. That would be four bets. You do not want that. Your top pair bad kicker is in terrible shape. So checking it back is often a good strategy, assuming your opponents will check raise you sometimes, both with good hands and bluffs, and put you in a bad spot. Now, if your opponent's going to be super straightforward and only check raise you on the turn with the nuts, then sure, bet, right? Because they're not going to raise you, and if they do raise you, you are dead. But you will find that... Your medium strength hands usually just want a little bit of money to go in. And a good way to do that is to check it back on either the flop or the turn or the river. And that's going to result in you not getting blasted off your hand. So that's it. Those are my 10 tips to crush cash gains. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, do me a favor. Click the like button down there. Also click the subscribe button while you're down there as well as the notification bell. We have a lot of great videos coming out on this YouTube channel. And I want to be sure you do not miss them. And if you have a tip for... Cash games you want to share with everyone else here? Write it in the comment section below. We'll appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good luck. I hope you learned a ton. And I hope you crush the cash games.